Tis the season to celebrate. You can treat yourself and the ones you love to a whiskey that delivers that perfect union of smoky and sweet. Try Glen Fittich Fire and Cane. Whether it's served neat or on the rocks, Fire and Cane, it challenges convention, packing equal parts citrus and sizzle in every sip. Learn more about the newest experimental whiskey from the masters at Glen Fittich by visiting glenfittich.com slash US. That is glenfittich.com slash US. Remember, of course, drinking alcohol involves risk. Please drink responsibly. It's perfectly possible and has always been possible to be extremely pro-Zionist and anti-Semitic. Think about it. If you have Jews that you don't want to live in your country, the idea of them having their own country is an extremely interesting idea. Hello, welcome to the Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is a strange and honestly unsettling time to be Jewish in America. We just saw in the synagogue shooting the deadliest act of anti-Semitic violence in American history. There has been an emboldening of anti-Semitism in this country. Um, I don't think Donald Trump himself is anti-Semitic. I say that in this episode. But there is much in his movement and in the things he has done or more importantly not done that seems to have emboldened anti-Semites. All of us who are journalists who write about these issues and are on social media get flooded with anti-Semitic commentary in ways that we didn't used to. And at the same time, Israel has become a very different place. It's become a much more illiberal place. The peace movement there has very much collapsed. The rise of politicians like Avigdor Lieberman, the right-wing lurch of, of Benjamin Netanyahu, it's made that space also feel unfriendly. It's made that space also feel like something going in a direction I, I, I can't support. So this is a podcast about something that I have been feeling and struggling with, which is the vulnerable feeling of being a liberal Jew in America right now, a Jew at a time when you when you're reminded that anti-Semitism, as has been said before, can be a very light sleeper, including here. And at the same time, you see other spaces in, in Jewry going in a very different direction from your values. I have found it to be a very uncomfortable place to be in. I've found it's made me reflect on my own Jewish identity and what it means to me and, and how it makes me feel and what parts I've taken for granted and what parts maybe I can't take for granted. I wanted to have my friend Peter Beinart on to talk about this. Peter was the editor of the New Republic, is now a professor of journalism and political science at City University of New York. He's a contributor to The Atlantic, a senior columnist at The Ford. He's written books about these issues. He's on CNN a lot. And he's a very brilliant guy and I think a courageous voice in this space. And so I was grateful he was willing to come on and talk about all this with me, both talk about how this has happened, how we've gotten to this place, and also try to talk about what this place really is. What are we feeling? What's real? What's just perception? And what should we make of all of it? So this is a, a little bit of a difficult episode for me to put out. These are not things I usually talk about that publicly. These are things I used to write about more and for reasons we'll discuss in here. I've, I've written about less, but it's all very personal to me. And so I was glad to have Peter here to try to work through it. As always, you can email me your thoughts at Ezra Klein Show at Vox.com. Here is Peter Beinart. Peter Beinart, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is a conversation I've wanted to have with you for some time, but have been honestly a little bit nervous to have because just like talking about being Jewish in this moment is a bit of a fragile thing, or it feels that way to me. Let me start here. Is anti-Semitism rising in America or does it just feel that way? I think it probably is. Partly is the problem we don't actually have a consensus definition of what anti-Semitism is. So, for instance, there's one wing of the American Jewish community that says that if you deny Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, that per se is anti-Semitism. Uh, on the Jewish left, people tend to deny that, right? They say that there is a theoretical possibility. I would include myself in that category of people who, even though I myself support a certain kind of Jewish state, who could suggest that, no, you could oppose the existence of a Jewish state and not be an anti-Semite. So part of the problem in figuring out how much anti-Semitism there is is we don't have a consensus in the American Jewish community or in the American political debate in general about what anti-Semitism is. So let me try to use a definition that feels more viscerally true to me, which is are Jews in America in more danger right now than they've been in recent years? Yes, I think we probably are. I mean, again, it's worth noting that we're in much, much less danger than the more vulnerable groups that Donald Trump is targeting. Absolutely. And we're in much less danger, I would say, than Jews in Europe. Even that danger, I think, has sometimes been hyped, but it's not dangerous to walk down 
in any American city, by and large, and wear, wearing a kippah, wearing a yarmulke, right? Uh, I think in a lot of European cities, that's a much more dicey proposition. Um, but if you compare uh, today to pre-Trump, yeah, I think Trump has help to bring things up in the surface, not even necessarily directly, but I think in a kind of a bank shot way that if you go after immigrants, Latino immigrants, some of that blows back onto Jews, even if you don't want it to. There's something interesting there. So I'm going to table the immigration dimension of this just for a second. So we just had the worst the most murderous anti-Semitic attack on American soil ever a couple weeks ago. Something that in addition to the horror of that, I was just very personally struck by was just a day or two after it, the synagogue or one of the synagogues I went to when I was a child was um, vandalized, which had not been what I expected right after that attack, right? I, I, I sort of thought there'd be a, I don't want to say a rallying around, but but there feels to me, I think the thing that I am picking up on is an emboldening, certainly in Europe, as you say, but then here too. And there's some weird way in which I don't think Donald Trump is personally anti-Semitic, but there is an undeniable way in which the people who are truly anti-Semitic feel emboldened by Donald Trump, feel he is fundamentally on their side. And you've done a lot of writing and thinking on this, so I'm, I'm curious why you think that is. I think that if you're prone to conspiracy theories and you have a fairly narrowly defined definition of what Americanism is, you end up bumping into anti-Semitism um, in a couple of ways. On the immigration question, the problem that racists have often had, anti-black and anti-Latino racists now, is that they see uh, Latino immigrants as a tremendous menace, but they also see them as inferior. So the question is, if they are so inferior, how are they going to organize themselves to come and bring a caravan and destroy the United States? And that's where Jews come in, because the, the anti-Semitic stereotype of Jews is different, right? It's them, they're kind of evil, but kind of sinister geniuses in a way. You saw this during segregation. I was kind of researching this for a piece I did recently for The Atlantic, what you saw was that a lot of racists in the South said, blacks couldn't possibly organize this civil rights movement themselves. Who's behind this? The Jewish communists. And I remember being the child of South Africans, that that was said in South, apartheid South Africa all the time, that Joe Slovo, the you know, Yiddish-speaking head of the military wing of the ANC, himself his own, is an amazing story, but he was often portrayed as the guy who must be running things because goodness knows the blacks couldn't be running it themselves. So that's one way in which I think, and you saw this with the Tree of Life shooter, right? He was obsessed with the caravan that Trump and Fox was hyping, but he thought, well, the Jews must be behind the caravan. And I think you see a little bit of a version of that with some of the economic globalist fears as well, right? There's a global economic conspiracy out there. Who's behind this? Well, it certainly can't be normal, good Americans like you and me. Maybe it's these shadowy Jewish figures. And of course, that has, there's a long history to that. So one of the places this goes that I am often uncomfortable with is the theories right now, they concentrate around George Soros. Right. Very wealthy financier, made a bazillion dollars shorting the, the British sterling, was it, right? Yes, uh, before yes. the pound? But has done remarkable work uh, promoting democracy across yes. Eastern Europe, um, has done a, a huge amount of philanthropy over the years, and has also become the center of a huge amount of right-wing conspiracy theorizing. And something that people often say is that these theories about George Soros are anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And I go back and forth on this because obviously they fit into a long lineage of that right. kind of anti-Semitic right. theorizing. On the other hand, there's a lot of theorizing about the Koch brothers. Right which I think sometimes is overblown, but I don't think it's, say, anti-Christian. And or people make this point about Adelson. I've heard how and Adelson, so, yes. You know, say, well, why isn't the, you know, people talk about Adelson as a hidden hand too. Why isn't that anti-Semitic? So that's my question for you, because you, you were just bringing up the, right. the economic globalist right. kind of thing. You know, people say nationalist is possibly yes. an anti-Semitic yes. idea, globalist. And, yes. And there's a way in which when you're talking about anti-Semitism, it can get a little like boxing with phantoms. Yes. Because things that are one way when the light catches it, you know, through an open window. Right. And then a whole other way right. in another context. And then it becomes really hard. You, you feel like you're crying wolf and you know there's something there, but you're not sure what it is. And often you're not sure it is always there. I think that Donald Trump may very often use words that are often used by anti-Semites right. in just a more normal, crude way. Right. Um, but not mean them to be anti-Semitic. 
but somehow be emboldening them. That feels yes. like a, it feels like a very complicated space in this conversation to me and one that is constantly being poorly handled. It is really complicated. First of all, I think with Trump, the best explanation for things is usually starts with ignorance, right? So it's quite possible that Donald Trump, just like he didn't know the other day that the leaders of, the, of Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia were not responsible for the Balkan Wars, doesn't actually know very much about the history of anti-Semitism. And so that's part of the reason that he's not being careful. I agree. I, look, I'm generally of the view that in the United States, certainly, people are innocent of anti-Semitism until proven guilty, right? And I'm generally willing to excuse one slip of the tongue, which seems to me a little bit problematic or disturbing, given my own radar, which may be more sensitive to others. I think it's kind of when you have an, a, a, you know, a series of different interests or whether people, when people have clearly kind of pushed back and said, listen, try to avoid this. Here's the story. And you're just basically willfully ignorant. And so I wouldn't call Trump an anti-Semite either because who knows what the heck is going on in his mind and his heart. What I would say is that you know, going back to that weird thing in 2013 with Jon Stewart, where he's basically like, why don't you give us your real name, Leibowitz? I mean, mm-hmm. there's a weird way in which he's poked at this in a way that's really unusual for American politicians. Like, I wouldn't say that about Mike Pence or Ted Cruz or most of the other Republicans I really disagree. It's hard to know what the heck is going on well, do there. Do you remember the thing that happened right after he was inaugurated? They had a um, proclamation about the Holocaust. right. right. And there was this outcry because they didn't specifically mention Jews in it. Right. And they sort of like um, – <laughs> they like all lives mattered, yes. Jews in the yes. Holocaust. Right. 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 They're like, no, no, well, you know, people who weren't Jewish died in the Holocaust too and it's right. true. Like yes. I, I remember when I was in Hebrew school, um, there was a particular day of remembrance when we would put on a little – gold star mm-hmm. and write six million in it. Mm-hmm. And I wrote 11 million because mm-hmm. I get, you know, well, and I, was precocious. A, I was very precocious. And kid. universalistic. Yeah. And, but mm-hmm. I, you know, but it was a very unusual thing for a mm-hmm. White House to do to not have a special notation about the fact that that was an eruption of anti-Jewish genocide right. in addition to being a lot of other kinds of violence too. So like the point that there's something in this administration that, again, it never quite verges into outright anti-Semitism, but I can definitely see how if I were an anti-Semite mm-hmm. looking for signals yes. that they were on my side, I'd be finding them. Yeah, and I think another thing you see in the Trump administration that we've seen for a while on the American right is that they believe that there are good Jews and bad Jews. And this is part of, I think, the way they refute charges of anti-Semitism, but also convince themselves that there's no anti-Semitism, which is to say, if Jews are nationalistic, Zionistic, religious, embodying the values that they really like, then they're super supportive of those Jews, be Benjamin Netanyahu or people who support his politics. And it's when Jews tend to embody certain things that they don't like about the United States, when Jews tend to be secular, when Jews tend to ally with other groups that they feel like are threatening American identity, when Jews seem in some way to represent a kind of rootlessness or, as Trump would say, globalism that they feel like is a larger problem, those are the Jews they tend to go after. And Soros has become this kind of figure for them like that. That's a super interesting point because I've been wanting to bring in as the other piece of this what's happened in Israeli politics over roughly the last decade and how that's affected the conversation about Jews in American politics, which is I remember growing up and then later on sort of being a political commentator sort of earlier in my career, and they're feeling like there was a real live battle for Israel's kind of political soul. You know, where is it going to go towards peace orientations and uh, a small d democratic view and and a view of national identity that was not purely religious where you could have sort of equality between people who who also aren't Jewish or was it going to go into a defensive crouched and ultimately was going to have to become extremely illiberal posture to survive. And it feels like it has decisively taken the second path. You know, I sort of feel like my moment of exiting the conversation was when Avigdor Lieberman Mm -hmm. became foreign secretary. And I just sort of figured, well, okay, like that's what Israel is now. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not something that I feel I can be on board with. But what's happened since then, which I think has been interesting, has been there's been a real, and I think this happened under Obama, a real left Republican Democratic polarization around Israel that didn't really exist in the same way before. Not to say Israel doesn't have baseline support among Democrats um, in, in politics, but in terms of support for the Israeli government as it stands in its current political configuration, it's become Netanyahu has allied himself with the Republican Party in a way that is I had not seen happen before. And that feels to me like it's helped create the sort of good Jew, bad Jew dichotomy where there's like a kind of Republican, nationalistic, you know, defensive, immigrant skeptic Jew. And then there's, you know, as you say, the sort of the rootless cosmopolitan Jew. And 
that feels like it's been really poisonous for the conversation. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. First of all, I think it's partly Netanyahu's Americanism. I mean, Israel had right-wing prime ministers like Yitzhak Shamir before, but Netanyahu, he's like the Republican senator from New York. He's such an American figure that I think it's very easy for American Republicans to love him. I mean, I think literally during the Obama administration, I heard them say, if only he were our president, you know? Like, they would say, he's the leader of the West that we don't have during the Obama years, which I thought was a very freighted phrase. But, but right, then for Americans who don't like him, he's like he was the Dick Cheney. You know, he's he's the equivalent of Dick Cheney, or now he's the equivalent of Donald Trump. So because he's so American, I think Americans have st- very strong opinions about him. But also, yeah, Israel has moved in the very direction that conservatives want America to move in. It's highly sovereignty oriented. It's extremely hostile to international law. It's becoming more religious, unlike the United States, which demographically is becoming less religious. Israel in the younger generation is more religious than the, which is the inverse of the United States. And it's at war essentially with the Muslim Muslim world. So it's kind of like the tip of the American spear in the clash of civilizations that Steve Bannon and these guys. So I think when they say that they are Zionists, I mean, not only them, by the way, Richard Spencer also interestingly now calls himself a Zionist. In one of the things that, which is really mind bending and comp, but is that you see what white nationalists increasingly often say, and culture says this all the time. You can't listen to like seven sentences of Ann Coulter where they're saying this, but people further than her say this too, Richard Spencer, David, they all say, you know what they say? We want an immigration policy like Israel's, right? Because Israel has an immigration policy designed to maintain its demographic and ethnic identity. Why can't we have that in the United States? So there's a lot of identification from the mainstream right all the way to the anti-Semitic right with Israel. And one of the things that drives me crazy in the mainstream conversation is that whenever someone is accused of trafficking anti-Semitism on the right, they say, I just bought a million dollars in Israel bonds. Don't you realize I want to go, you know, I love Israel more than anything. I'm plastering my house with Israeli flags. What the media generally doesn't understand is that it's perfectly possible and has always been possible to be extremely pro-Zionist and anti-Semitic. Think about it. If you have Jews that you don't want to live in your country, the idea of them having their own country is an extremely interesting idea. So the Polish government in the 1930s, for instance, right, which was a very anti-Semitic government, was so pro-Zionist, they actually sent Polish army officers to fight along with Beitar, along with Zionist militias, with the Irgun, because they were desperate for Jews to get their own state because that would solve the Polish-Jewish question, right? So you see this connection from the American right with Israel. And you on the left, I think there's a growing sense of some consciousness among some groups of people of color, activists, of seeing Israel in some ways as aligned with exactly the forces that in the United States they don't like. So one of the things that Black Lives Matter has been really activated around is the close connection between Israeli and American police force, for instance, in terms of crowd control. And so you're seeing both sides essentially come to see Israel as a representation of either what they want America to be or what they don't want America to be. It's funny that when when you say all that, one of the things it's making me think about is how many arguments I had you know, in the aughts, that you could be very pro-Jewish without Mm -hmm. necessarily being a right-wing Zionist, Mm -hmm. right? That there was a, there was a brand of Zionism that people often wanted to force you to buy into Mm -hmm. or else you were an anti-Semite or you were a self-hating Jew. And I was always arguing, no, that (laughs) there there are a lot more options on the table than that. Um, You know, read Haaretz was always Mm -hmm. the the line from that Mm -hmm. period. But what you're saying and what feels really true to me is that you can be a right-wing Zionist without being all that pro-Jewish. You don't have to be an anti-Semite, right? I, I, I take your yes. point that you can be that too. Yes. But I had not put words to this before, but that there are a lot of there are a lot of folks in in American right of center politics who feel to me like they're very pro-Netanyahu Zionism without actually being very pro-Jewish at all, seem to in fact be skeptical of a lot of um, say American Jews. Right. And also remember, it's deeply ingrained within the Zionist ethos itself to look down on diaspora Jews, right? The whole logic of Zionism itself is that Jews, not just that Jews can't be safe in the diaspora, but that they can't self-actualize in the diaspora. They can never be fully human. They can never reach their full potential in diaspora. So in certain kind of way, the more you embrace the Zionist ethos, the more you're likely to take a dim view of American Jewish life, especially in a society which is in which, you know, which is assimilating at a very fast rate, right? In which you can easily see the Jewish content of American Jewish life is getting thinner and thinner. So it's not in a certain kind of way just anti-Semites who might be pro-Israel, but in a certain kind of way, there's a way in which the Zionist ethos itself is very dismissive of diaspora Jewish life. Some of the very things that we, the diaspora Jews, tend to love about, um, about themselves, 
their embrace of multiculturalism, in some ways from a Zion's ethos is part of the problem. Tis the season to celebrate. Treat yourself and the ones you love to a whiskey, a delicious whiskey that delivers a perfect union of smoky and sweet. Try Glenfiddich Fire and Cane. Learn more about the newest experimental whiskey from the masters at Glenfiddich by visiting glenfiddich.com slash US. Again, that is glenfiddich.com slash US. And of course, drinking alcohol, it involves risk. Please drink responsibly. At a time when we're so focused on the, I don't know, eccentricities of our own political leadership, it can be refreshing and helpful to think about those who have risen to the occasion during the most dangerous points in history. The Great Courses Plus has created a brand new course all about this. It's about how Winston Churchill changed the world. It's a fascinating, multifaceted look at Churchill's complexities and his legacy. It looks at his role in World War II, his diplomatic maneuverings, his investment in Britain's military, and his refusal to make peace with Hitler, even when it seemed to be his only option. With The Great Courses Plus, you'll have unlimited access to not only this course, but any of their thousands of fascinating lectures on virtually any topic. I want you to start enjoying The Great Courses Plus. I think there's a lot you'll enjoy there, from cooking and photography to economics and political science. If you're here, you love learning. When you go there, you can learn about whatever you want. So they're giving my listeners an exclusive limited time offer to do that. Get your first three months at 50% off the regular price. That is three full months to learn about anything at all that interests you at an incredible discount. But to get this offer, you got to sign up through my URL within the next few weeks. That is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. Remember, the special offer to get your first three full months at 50% off is only available for a limited time and only at this URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. Again, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. One of the places I want to take this conversation, which is a little bit of a trickier place to take it, is just the experience of this right now. My experience of it, which has been surprising to me to feel, because I had, you know, the old line that anti-Semitism is a light sleeper. (laughs) I'd grown up in a time when it just didn't feel like that to me. It felt like that was an aftershock of another age. And, you know, now it feels a little bit more like that to me. But I have had the experience, and I'm not saying it's a a valid experience. I'm just saying it is mine. I'm not saying it's true or kind of objectively correct about the situation. But Israel as a kind of conceptual safe space feels a lot more unwelcoming. It feels like it as a place has gone in a direction that as somebody who believes in kind of liberal human values, I can't support. And America seems to have a real emboldening of a kind of conspiratorial anti-Semitism that I thought had weakened more than it had weakened, was was further gone than I had expected. I mean, I think a lot of us who are journalists right now, who are on Twitter, who are engaged in online commentary, the flood of anti-Semitic vitriol that has accompanied the rise of Donald Trump, and again, this I'm really not blaming him for, but I am blaming some subset of his space for, has been shocking, like genuinely shocking. I just didn't see that one coming. Nor did I. And – you know, and then you see it translating into real violence, real vandalism. What's going on in Europe is unnerving. And like, yeah, like there's a way in which it feels like there's a an awakening anti-Semitism again or an emboldening anti-Semitism at the same time that Israel, which had a much broader representation of different kinds of Jewry, seems like it is closed down into a particular version of itself, which as a country, that's its choice. I don't like it, but, you know, like, (laughs) I I do believe in sovereignty to some degree. But I found it to be a very vulnerable feeling position. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, since I live on the Upper West Side of of New York, I probably feel it less than a lot of other people do. But I think what the political consequences of this increased sense of vulnerability are will be really interesting because it can go politically in a couple different directions, right? And we're seeing, you know, on the one hand, there is the argument that says, and this is what people on the right have been saying for a while, is that the safest bet for American Jews is to align with white Christians. First of all, white Christians have the power, so it's not a bad thing to align with people who actually have the power. Secondly, and I think you see this in Netanyahu, always seen this, that there's the genuine belief that We are on their side in this huge culture war. After all, they talk about Judeo-Christian America, after all. And there is, in weirdly, even despite the rising anti-Semitism, a tremendous amount of philo-Semitism in the Christian right. 
in the sense that Jews are a way of getting in touch with the quote unquote Old Testament, right? And also again, that Jews represent the West. Jews are the outpost of the West in this sea of our enemies. And so I think there's one argument that says, you know, and in a way it's not exactly the same, but you know, again, I am the child of, of South Africans and um, there are echoes for me about the way I remember these debates within our own family. People would say, no, 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 stick with the Afrikaners. They support Israel, first of all. They were very supportive of Israel. They traded arms with Israel. But also, they want Jews because they see Jews as white. That's an amazing accomplishment. They see us as white. Don't squander that, right? And then there's the second group, which is much where I think my heart is, and I imagine your heart is, it says no, that actually our tradition itself, right, which 36 times in the Torah says, remember the heart of the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt or some version of that, says that we must see ourselves aligned with a stranger, but also they are our better allies. They are more reliable allies because they also feel this marginality. And also if they succeed and they open up American identity, this is what Jews bet on during the civil rights movement, right? Just at the time when social anti-Semitism was, it still existed. There were still quotas at Ivy League schools in the early 60s, some Ivy League schools. Jews said, if African-Americans win, we will ride their coattails and all the barriers will end for us, right? The other group says, no, 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 if African-Americans win, if Latinos win, we will win too. And they will actually prove to be our best allies because they understand. And I've seen the most moving and touching thing for me in the Trump era of almost anything else has been the way Muslims have rallied around Jews. I mean, we saw it publicly with this incredible outpouring of, of donations after Tree of Life. But in my own reporting, when I used to report about anti-Muslim stuff and I would call people Muslim activists or whatever, and if they knew I was Jewish, they would say to me often, Listen, Peter, I know this is not what you're writing about. I'm just saying you, we have to stick together. And that, I think there's a visceral understanding of a lot of people in the American Muslim community. And the question is really whether we're going to reciprocate that. Because although I think most American Jews would, the American Jewish leadership is highly ambivalent about this question because it has a strong wing that's rooted in the Trump's Republican Party. One of the things uh, I think has been interesting is that for all that Donald Trump has really tried to have, uh, again, a very pro-Netanyahu government is maybe the way I'm going to put this, right. uh, foreign policy, it is not, as far as we can tell from the recent midterm elections, led to any kind of gain among political support in American Jewry. Like, right. th there's a right. real visceral rejection of Donald right. Trump. Right, because outside of the Orthodox community, which is about, they say, 10% of American Jews, the other 90% of American Jews don't really vote on Israel. They vote on American domestic issues, and they essentially, the most highly salient political fact, although it's a little embarrassing for everyone to I think acknowledge, to understand American Jewish political behavior, the most important thing to understand is how secular Jews are. It's not essentially their Jewishness, it's their secularism. They vote like highly secular people on issue, you know, abortion, gay rights, these issues that track with, with education and with secularism. And that roots them in the Democratic Party and puts them totally at odds with Trump. So I, I want to go back to something we were talking about a little bit ago, because I, I do think it figures in here on the nature of anti-Semitism as a kind of conspiracy theory that interlocks with other political opinions. Mm -hmm. The idea that... You have different kinds of bigotry that operate mm -hmm. simultaneously. Some kinds of bigotry are saying that a group of people is less than. Mm -hmm. They are less intelligent than you. They are less human than you. They are less civilized than you. They right. are less moral, moral than you. And then the other is this kind of, as you put it, like sinister mastermind mm -hmm. right. for, form of bigotry. Right. And it's only been reading some of the commentary after Tree of Life mm -hmm. that I've understood how long a lineage there is yes. of connecting different kinds of – equality movements mm. where, you know, the idea is that on the one hand, you have groups you believe, and this coming from the perspective of the bigots, like groups you believe are less than mm. who are somehow organizing effectively. And so you have to add Jews into the mix as um, tacticians yes. or else the whole the whole picture can't make sense. Yes. It's a very Baroque view of the world. Yes. I think it – you know, I'm not an historian of this. My sense is that it partly has its roots in the class position that Jews held in medieval Europe. In a, Jews were not the peasantry, but they were not the nobility either. What they were, were um, they were much more literate than others because uh, their religious traditions tended, especially women tended to be much more literate than other women. They were also because of, the, they were allowed to uh, earn interest on loans, which in medieval Europe, the Christians weren't supposed to do. And they were urbanized. And they also had these transnational networks, right? The Jews spoke a common language. They could basically create business networks and they could become money lenders, right? Financiers and merchants 
merchants. So they, in some ways, were much more privileged than most of the people in medieval Europe. But a, also— A market-dominant minority. Yes, exactly. Is, but, the, is like the technical term. Right? Yes, exactly right. Like the, maybe the Chinese in Malaysia or something, right? right? Yes. But also vulnerable because they were politically not disempowered. They had money but not power. And uh, it's funny. There's Jeremy Suri, who's a historian at University of Texas, has this fascinating riff on Henry Kissinger uh, and Kissinger's view of global politics where he argues that it's partly rooted in a deeply Jewish fear of populism. Because for Jews, the, the terrifying thing was always the peasant revolt. The peasants couldn't get to the nobles, but they could get to the Jews who the peasants, who the nobles sent out to collect money or who were doing these. And there were echoes of this a little bit in, in the 60s when Jews were in African-American neighborhoods as landlords or as, you know, owning stores. And so that intermediate position has, on the one hand, made Jews seem higher up, but on the other hand, been a source of vulnerability. So that's operating in the kind of anti-Semitic psyche. And at the same time, it feels to me that one of the big contributors to this period has been just digital media generally. You now have everybody with like the little parentheses around their thing right. that is meant to show solidarity but emerges out of anti-Semites online, like putting those parentheses right. around the, right. the names of people in the media who are Jewish. And I wonder how much the the feelings and concerns, at least if you take Tree of Life out of the equation, which I know is a strange thing to do given when we're talking. But aside from that unbelievable outbreak of violence, is this just one of these things where the internet exposes things that were already there and then the media kind of amplifies it and reports on it and makes it feel like a more present threat than it really is? Like, do you take what we see online as an example that anything has changed or just that digitally there's now this capacity to like see it in your comment threads or your, your Twitter mentions and it's a very low cost for the anti-Semites to reach you? And so we're not really seeing anything new. We're just seeing the sort of online visibility of things that are always there. Yeah. I mean, clearly there were neo-Nazis. There were acts of violence before the internet. People are able to create communities in the way they weren't before, clearly. And as you mentioned earlier, I do think that Donald Trump perhaps has given people a sense of comfort or being emboldened in a way that has strengthened them. And I also just think, and again, it's more my gut than anything I could prove, I just think it's difficult to disentangle. If you're in a climate where bigotry is being legitimized in general, I just think it's difficult to segment off. I mean, it's like most of these people are anti-Semites. It's not like they have a great opinion of, you know, feminists, you know, uh, LGBT folks, right. African Americans, right? That huge world of feminist anti-Semites. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a package deal, right? And so in some ways, like, I think, again, it's like you buy the package and Jews are part of the package, you know? I want to be careful about this because I'm not sure this is true. And maybe it's about what I see. Mm -hmm. I actually think that the political power that is being wielded against um, other minorities in mm. this country, specifically um, the Hispanic immigrants mm. and, and African Americans, is much more dangerous. Mm. But there does seem to be something about online anti-Semitism that is particularly intense. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like maybe it's just what I see, right? Yeah. I, I am Jewish and I'm not African American. Mm. So, uh, you know, I only have my vantage point on this. But the ways in which particularly anti-Semitism seems to be a popular form of like young male transgressive mm -hmm. action yeah. on the internet yeah. does seem a little specific. You know, part of this notion that, that is so strong on the right these days is that we have this politically correct culture where you have to tiptoe around all these other groups, right? Um, and um, sometimes you hear Jews saying this too, you know, conservative Jews vis-a-vis -vis African Americans or, you know, women or whatever. But in a certain kind of way, I think part of what may be happening is that the truth is that Jews have been because the Jewish community is very well organized and very politically kind of articulate, have been extremely effective, I would say, in having an influence in the public discourse. I mean, just think about the word, the use of the word Holocaust, right? Or the use of the word anti-Semitism. We have essentially been able to have certain words that reflect particularly about the attacks on us, make them into very powerful loaded terms, right? And I think in a certain way, for those people who buy into this, I think, nonsensical idea that the big problem in America is that people are too sensitive, right? And that um, in a way, maybe they see Jews as the group that has been most effective in preventing anybody from hurting their feelings, right? And so there does seem to be this weird way that the anti contemporary anti-Semitism today loves to play with that, right? All these Holocaust jokes, kind of, right? All these is kind of like, you're not going to tell me that I can't tread on this kind of thing. Besides, maybe I'm just joking, ha, 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 you know? And it's this like transgressive thing 
fighting against, if there is a politically correct culture, meaning too much sensitivity, which I'm not, don't necessarily buy, Jews are definitely part of that in the sense that like Jews are probably quicker than anyone else as an organized group, just because I think we're more politically articulate, better organized to respond very quickly to a sense that we are being attacked. And I think maybe that's part of what's playing into this. It's something I'm always fascinated by in the conversation about political correctness, Mm -hmm. because there are plenty of Jews who are on the other side of that conversation Mm -hmm. from me, plenty of Jews who feel like the PC police have gone way too far. And the thing I always think when I see that is that the thing that a lot of people who have been bound Mm -hmm. by social political correctness Mm -hmm. want to say Mm -hmm. is not that I can misgender trans people, Mm -hmm. but that Jews are bad. Mm-hmm, <laughs> or that, mm-hmm. I always think the political, like the, the reality of the political correctness debate in America is just much cruder mm-hmm. than these sort of like campus fights mm-hmm. make it seem like. And it's like we in the media have a lot of debates and they're like angry and they're intense about like the like the new frontiers in political right. correctness, right? The groups that are just now getting enough power yeah. to make their claims. But when Donald Trump like ran for president, mm. What he said was immigrants are bad. He said right. that Hispanic immigrants are rapists and criminals and maybe a couple of them are good people too. Right. He was not coming out to say, God, I just do not like safe spaces. Right. I think trigger warnings right. on certain pieces of canon literature are problematic. Right. And the thing that is being bound in political correctness is – it's usually, and I think it's dominantly, right. much more widespread and ancient forms of hatred, right? In, and very much including against Jews, right? right. Um, and Jews have very effective organizations, the Anti Defamation League, etc., that basically enforce certain kinds of speech boundaries, right? And we do not. As always, right, whenever a group is effective at this battle, it stops becoming identity politics. It stops becoming political correctness. Now it's just like being a decent person. Right. But it's the same kind of thing. Right. And the desire to establish a bunch of principles that go harshly in the other direction never seems to me to be a long-term wise strategy. Right. The thing that drives me crazy often with kind of, you know, conservative Jews is that I feel like they tend to bend over backwards to give Republicans the benefit of the doubt when it comes to racism, sexism, et cetera. And yet they're, you know, to use it, they're so machmir, like they're so hardline on anti-Semitism, right? Anything which seems can, to me often just like a severe criticism of Israel for them can become anti-Semitism. And yet I'm saying like, if you're going to be that hardline on the anti-Semitism stuff, fine. But then have the same standard for the racism and sexism stuff. Don't basically, don't, you know, be consistent. So let me use this as a bridge to talk a little bit about um, Israel. Mm -hmm. As somebody who is less versed in Mm. Israeli politics than you are, and and you and I used to have debates about this Mm -hmm, sometimes. mm -hmm. Um, I I used to occasionally write in hearts. I was more involved in this discussion at a certain point in my career, but I've not been as much. And one of the reasons I've not been is just the feeling that the set of political possibilities in Israel has collapsed. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the sort of peace movement in Israel feels Mm -hmm. like it has collapsed. And I'm, I'm curious sort of what your gloss on why that is. Yeah. And I actually want to ask you about that too when we get a second because yeah. I feel like um, – we, we, got, we got all the time. <laughs> your, your decision not to write about this I think is is actually significant. And you know, without buttering you up, it's actually – and I think indicative of something. And f- honestly, to be honest, I, I sometimes ask myself or my wife will ask me like, why the heck am I writing about it so much? Like because as you say, there's a very strong feeling of beating your head up against the wall. First of all, because you're right, the legacy of the Second Intifada moved Israel to the right. There was a very, very strong narrative after the end of the Second Intifada in 2004 and then the Gaza withdrawal in 2005 that Israel had withdrawn from Gaza. It had given the Palestinians everything they could have wanted in the Camp David negotiations, and it had been met with terrorism, right? I always try to tell people that it's important to distinguish the power of a subjective narrative from the historical accuracy that a lot of people thought America lost Vietnam because we were stabbed in the back by the anti-war movement and that helped elect Ronald Reagan. Didn't make it true, right? I think actually empirically both of those arguments don't have a lot to recommend them if you look carefully at what happened, but that has helped move Israel to the right, plus the demographic shift, right? Growing population of ultra and modern Orthodox Jews, a Russian population that's further to the right. And so, yes, all of those things are, are true. And also, you know, the Israel debate in the United States is 
nasty. It's intimate, which is part of what I like about it. Like, I like the fact that people care so much. Like, even the guy who, like, accosted me on the way to shul, like, last year while I was with my kids and his kids, and he said, are you Peter Bynard? I said, yeah, like, a, like an idiot. I said, yeah, I am Peter Bynard. He says, I think your politics are full of shit. You know, like, there's a perverse part of me that Shabbat likes- Shabbat Shalom. I know, Shabbat, I was like, I was like, it's Shabbos, you know, like, but there's a part of me, perverse part of me that likes the fact that people care so much. Like, if I write about a lot of other things, I feel like, eh, people are just like, they, you know, but in a way, it's an ugly little sandbox, you know, and it's like, I think, in a parochial little sandbox. So it's very difficult to tell a story in which change comes from within. If I had to tell a story in which there's change, the story I would tell would be the change will come from the Palestinians because they're the ones who have the incentive to change things, right? They're the ones who are being oppressed, right? People who are, you know, Frederick Douglass said, power can seize nothing without a demand, right? The Palestinians will continue to find ways of making life uncomfortable for Israelis, whether it's violent intifadas, nonviolent uprisings, various things. Right now, the cost of occupation is low for Israel. So there's no political need. In recent Israeli elections, they haven't even really focused on this issue that much. Eventually, because Israel has this setup where there's a kind of indirect rule in the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority basically runs things on Israel's behalf, mostly funded by the Europeans. Israel, Israel doesn't have to send its 18-year-olds to patrol every Palestinian village. If it sees some guys it doesn't like, it calls up the PA, who sends their guys in there. And the PA picks up the garbage, they run the schools, they do all that stuff. Eventually, I believe the PA will collapse. It has no legitimacy among Palestinians. Palestinians didn't sign up to create their own subcontracted occupation. They thought this was gonna become a state. When that collapses, Israel faces a much tougher choice. Do we directly control the West Bank, which is, a, you know, send our 18-year-olds to, to walk through the narrow pathways in Hebron and Kalkilia? The reason the Oslo was created was because the first intifada showed Israelis that the cost was high. What I hope is that when that moment happens, there has to be a new conversation in Israel because the cost of occupation goes way up, which may embolden the far right, too. They may say, you know, we have a great answer. Put them on buses and send them to Jordan, but also creates an opportunity for the left that American politics will be in a different place. And Bernie Sanders is doing a lot of interesting things in that regard. So you, you see, your view is that what happened is, because uh, b- before we go into how yeah. it could change, I'm, yeah. uh, I, w- I want to pin down the story of yeah. what happened is that Basically, there are two things. One was that the pullout of Gaza, Mm -hmm. the legacy of the Intifada, and the fact that it just was able to recede as an issue because a security and distancing and subcontracting strategy basically removed its salience Mm -hmm. allowed for the whole thing to just recede. I guess this is a question I've had. It feels to me like there was a very sharp point at which things changed. Mm -hmm. It was like Ahud Barak loses Mm -hmm. to Ariel Sharon. It felt to me like there was a centrist coalition with Ehud mm. Olmer and yeah. they sort of lose out to Netanyahu. And after that, there was like no Israeli left in Israeli politics yeah. of any real note. And yeah. it went from being a very vital part of mm. the political situation yeah. to very weakened very quickly. Yeah. And that doesn't seem to me to track onto the timing of after effects of the Intifada. Maybe it tracks onto mm. the timing of, of getting out of Gaza and it just mm. reducing in salience. Yeah. But I've never quite understood the nature of that collapse. Yeah. So I would say you, you have the Camp Haven negotiations in the summer of 2000. Then in the fall of 2000, you have this second Intifada. The second Intifada, which is much more violent, much more violence against civilians, suicide bombing, et cetera, than the first intifada and lasts four years, definitely damages the Israeli left dramatically. Also because Ehud Barak endorses the narrative. Ehud Barak himself, partly to save himself politically, says, no, no, I was a super dove. I gave them everything. And look, Arafat responded with, with this violence. So that hurts the left dramatically in Israel. Plus, you have a long-term demographic trend, which is that the Labor Party and Meretz, which is to its left, are relying on secular Ashkenazi Israelis who are a diminishing part of the population. And the other part, and this part is not almost never, I think, discussed enough in the American media. The nature of the Israeli political system is that to create a Knesset majority of 61 seats, by tradition, you have to have 61 Jewish seats. It is not considered legitimate to bring in the Arab Israelis, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and their political parties to get to the majority. And that always means that the right is in power. It's almost the equivalent of not being able to rely on African-American votes for the Democratic Party in the United States. So what you find— And there's nothing in the rules about that. Nothing in the rules, but the notion is this is a Jewish state. If we're going to make big decisions for the state, there has to be a Jewish majority in the Knesset. And so even when you had Ehud Barak there or Yitzhak Rabin, in order to fish around for his Knesset majority, 
majority. He had to go to more right-wing or religious parties that didn't really share his values. And I think part of the conversation that we're still not really having in the United States, which is a challenging conversation to have, which has to do with the nation of Jewish statehood, has to do with looking under the hood a little bit and understanding better the ways in, in which the tensions between liberal democracy and real equality and Jewish statehood as it exists in Israel today condition a whole series of things. But you also notice that people in the American press are frequently refer, use the term Israelis as synonym for Jewish Israelis, yep. right? Like all Israelis from left to right oppose the Iran deal. Really? 20% of the population, right? That's larger than either African Americans or Hispanics, liked Barack Obama, supported the Iran deal, wildly for a Palestinian state, right? And that's often erased in our conversation. That's super. That, that's an interesting and, and fair point and, and reflects my language as well. One of the things that struck me at that period is that the right-wing coalition got a lot more right, too. Yeah. And I think that was actually the thing for me. And, and I'm happy to talk about sort of like my my evolution on this stuff. But for me, the real break came around, not Netanyahu, who's a figure in Jewish politics I always like saw and understood. Yeah. And like he's like, you know, part of the firmament and has been for a long time. But it was the rise of Avigdor Lieberman. Right. Who was – so deeply illiberal yes. and so violent to what I understood as the political character of Israel, right? This idea that Israel was this really beautiful and very unusual mixture, mm -hmm. a haven for a Jewish people and also a place to believe deeply in liberal values. And when Avigdor Lieberman was made foreign secretary and when he rose up, that was when it just seemed to me that Israel had gone somewhere I had not expected it to go. Mm. And I guess like the reason I stopped writing about it, to be honest, and it, I mean, one reason is that like foreign policy isn't my main right. issue. Right. You know, there's right. like only so many things. Right. But the, the reason I wrote about Israel was that I, I had a real and, and have to some degree a uh, kind of emotional connection to it. Yeah. You know, like I've yeah. been to Israel a number of times. Yeah. Um, my family has been, you know, my grandparents took me when I was young. And I yeah. mean, I was just, I was there and I think the last time was probably 07. And something about that turn mm. began to snap the connection. Mm. And it was mm. the mixture mm. of that political turn with some of the kind of like calling me a self-hating Jew for writing. Mm -hmm. It just – it didn't really change how I felt, but it changed my view that I had really sort of – that it made sense for me to be prioritizing this mm. over other issues that were I think also extremely important yes. in, in yes. the world. And so just some of my attention just went elsewhere because it felt like – you know, Israel is a nation. It had chosen a political path that I thought was very, very self-destructive, but it right. was its choice to make. But it kind of like broke the idea for me that it was partially mine too, mm, right? Mm. Which I think I, like a lot of young Jews, had that like Israel, even though I wasn't – I'm not there. I don't, yeah. you know, plan yeah. to plan to live there. Um, it's partially mine too. Yes. And – that somehow in some way I can't quite explain was related not just to its Jewish character but to its liberal character, yeah. right? Not yeah. like liberal in the kind of left-right American way but liberal in the overall liberal values way. Right. And as that weakened, that emotional connection for me um, weakened too. Yeah. Yeah. And at some point it just – it seemed that I was writing about something that I just didn't quite understand why I was writing about it yeah. anymore. Like yeah. as opposed to – a million, not a million, right. but dozen other conflicts right. that were causing more loss of life and right. more suffering elsewhere in the world. Right. Well, see, this is in some ways the structural disadvantage of the Jewish left in the United States, which is that it's composed of people like you who are morally universalistic. So you care about a whole range of things. This is even a if they don't totally affect, reasonable point. <laughs> right. And in a way, this is why even if there are as many Jews who sympathize with J Street with APAC, APAC is stronger because the Jews who support J Street are also spending part of their money on climate change and immigrants' rights. The APAC people are tribal. Right? So they're very single yep. issue focused, right? And they stay in that game because they're focused, they're concerned about what they think is good for Jews, right? This is in some ways what, when I go to speak on college campuses about this, if I speak to college students, the harder sell is not to convince them that what the Netanyahu government is doing is bad. The harder thing is to convince them, and it's very hard, is why they should pay any attention to this, given that climate change is going yep. on, right? And for me personally, I can only say it's because I'm not actually that pure universalist. Like I have a very strong tribal streak that was infused in me. And like for me, the fate of the Jewish people is of paramount importance. Partly, I think I stay involved because I feel very much inspired and connected to people on the Israeli left who I really admire. It was, I was at a Shabbat lunch a few a year ago with a really brilliant Israeli academic and she had a job at Princeton and she was going back to teach at Tel Aviv University. 
And I said, why are you going back? I said, do you see any hope of changing things? And she said, no, I'm like an abolitionist in the 1820s. And she said, but this is my country and I'm going to be there for it. And I thought, you know, when I go with people in Breaking the Silence, you know, to, I feel like if they are willing to do this, then I feel like they're in Mississippi, the equivalent of Mississippi. I'm the guy sitting on the Upper West Side. The least I can do is to support them if they're doing it. But the other thing for me, and again, I think just personally, it's probably being the child of South Africans, is for me, what's on trial in Israel is Judaism in a certain sense, which is to say Judaism, I find, has had a, a magnificent set of ethical interventions and, and, and arguments and ideas over the centuries. They've had a big impact in the world. But the, the tricky thing was that they were, the entire Jewish ethical tradition is forged in powerlessness. It's never yeah. tested by power. So for me, and there is this great kind of interaction in Yehuda Halevi's book, Kuzari, where he's talking to the pagan king and he's saying, we Jews have an ethical tradition that's better than Christianity. You know, in, in Jewish tradition, Christianity is called Edom, red, blood, associated with the figure of Esau, violent. And the king, pagan king says, what are you talking about? You just haven't had the opportunity yet, you know? And for me, in a way, if it turns out that Israel is the great test of Jewish power because it's Jewish sovereignty, and if Israel fails that test, for me, in a certain kind of sense, so much of what I was raised to believe and I want to believe about the Jewish tradition becomes kind of bullshit. And so for me, that's why it matters, even though I have no expectation that I'll move to Israel either. But, you know, it's very hard to say that uh, things are not looking good. <laughs> Coming up next, hear advertiser content from ZipRecruiter about one business looking for the right candidates on the road to Hired. This is The Road to Hired, brought to you by ZipRecruiter. And this is the sound of success. Greg Donner and Ron Lom run the Rockridge Group, a staffing and recruiting company in Silicon Valley. And every time they sign a new client, they bang a gong with a soup ladle. Not surprising for two old friends who are huge fans of 80s hair metal. As you can see, I still live in the 80s. The feathered hair and everything looks good. Greg and Ron use ZipRecruiter and its matching technology to find highly specialized professionals to work in the tech sector. And finding that perfect fit is no easy task. It's one of those needles in the haystack that have been kicked around by every internal recruiter and maybe external agency. And they're doing this at volume. Using ZipRecruiter is really our main source of how we're able to find those candidates and individuals that fit those needs. It's the first place we go to post a role. We'll use the resume database where we're finding something rather tricky and we want to try to be a bit more proactive. For these guys, it's not just about winning business and ringing that gong. They go to sleep at night knowing they've just put people to work. You know, I can put my head down every night and fall asleep. Yeah, you got someone a job. You got someone a job. And someone who needed a job. And then when, when they say to you, thank you so much, this is a life changer, that's a big deal. When it comes to hiring for even the most challenging positions, ZipRecruiter's powerful technology makes it easy. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Thanks for that message from ZipRecruiter. Try ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. Again, that is ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. Now back to our show. One of the things that I found very depressing about the direction that Judaism in Israel went, I, I don't want to say Judaism, the direction that the political leadership in Israel went was ultimately, it seemed like a very dangerous one. Mm -hmm. You've probably read, uh, I'm sure you have, Philip Ross' Operation Shylock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where Philip Roth creates is kind of alternative Philip Roth, yes, saying yes, things yes, that Philip Roth yes. clearly believes yes. but doesn't quite want to be tagged. For, it's a very interesting and unusual yeah. book. But, you know, the, the argument made in there that what you're going to do is you're going to pack the maximum number of Jews into the smallest possible space, mm -hmm. surround them with people who hate them, mm -hmm. and then execute a long-term political strategy based on making those people hate them even more. Yes, yes. It seems like the idea that they are safeguarding the fate of the Jewish people in a yeah. wise way mm -hmm. has struck me as not true for some time now. Like just as a pure question of like long-term tactical thinking or strategic thinking rather, Israel cannot possibly be safe in a world of weapons of mass destruction with everyone around them hating them and with this population in their midst yeah. who is becoming endlessly radicalized. Yes. But it's like I, yes. that's not a – that's obviously yes. not a decision that I can or have the right or have the traction to make for anybody there. But, well, but it, it did become this way in which – one of the constant statements about like why you should be so concerned about Israel, which is right. like it is a safe home for the Jews. Right. Like, I would look and think 
it, it feels to me like it's in right. the, like long term, like this is a very dangerous strategy. Absolutely. Very and, high risk. Right. And you do have the right to make that argument. First of all, just like you have the right to criticize Bolsonaro in Brazil. Sure. Right. And I do. You have the right, <laughs> yeah, right? So, enough. you know, the UN says that Gaza will be unlivable by 2020, partly because there will be no water, right? And no drinkable water. Like that's just down the beach from Tel Aviv. You know, like that's insane. Like the idea that you can extract yourself from the conditions of the people in which you live. And as you say, 20% of the Israel's own population inside the green line are Palestinians, right? They call them Arab Israelis, but they're Palestinians. And right now, the danger is not as apparent. But ultimately, as population shifts, the Palestinians also have another big advantage over Israeli Jews that I think is not commonly understood. I think the Palestinians understand, I think the Jews don't really recognize it, which is to say, most Israeli Jews, and this is kind of ironic given Zionism, they actually do have somewhere else to go right? They are a first world population, which is generally quite connected to other first world populations. If things in Israel get bad, they can go to Canada or Australia, right? Even today, some of them do that, right? They go to Silicon Valley, right? The Palestinians don't really have anywhere to go just because of the nature of their economic circumstance. So in a certain kind of way, they can wait the Jews out. Let's imagine you get to a situation where you're basically in long-term civil war with constant violence and the economic economy going down. And the Palestinians, like, that's not going to be that much worse for them than things are now. But for Israeli Jews, it's going to be a dramatic, and, and they will start to immigrate. And that's ultimately, I think, how if Zionism loses and if the Jewish state loses, that's what will happen. It will be because of immigration, because Jews will ultimately, they won't stay the mobile part of the population. And so this is why I think, and Palestinians have always been saying this point. They've always been saying, don't you get it? The two-state solution is more necessary for you than it is for us, right? But I think through arrogance, you know, the Israeli political leadership, the American Jewish leadership have forgotten that. And they've, they've bought into this idea that, again, because Mohammed bin Salman whispers in their ear and says, we don't really care about the Palestinians. They can make the Palestinians knuckle under and they can live high on the hog without the Palestinians causing them problems. Yeah, so I think that is all very well taken. The other thing I want to pick up on in what you said is this idea that if Israel continues this hard turn towards the right, it will break for you some idea of what Jewishness is. And I was trying to think about how that landed with me because I realized that I didn't quite feel that way. But what I did feel was that I had always really rejected and really been offended by the conflation of how Jewish you were, how you felt about Judaism, how, how much you identified with it, what you had learned from it, and how you felt about the ongoing political strategy of Israel. Going back before some of like the, the current turn to the right, like that, that was always a rhetorical move that I was very um, angry about and continue to be to, to this day. But, but one thing that has definitely happened for me is because I don't, I think, make that link to the degree mm -hmm. some people do. Mm -hmm. As Zionism has moved into a place that is more directly in conflict with what I understand Judaism to be, and mm -hmm. particularly, I, I think I understand Judaism mm -hmm. very much as you do, and mm -hmm. it's a religion of the dispossessed, mm -hmm. it's a religion of recognizing that you too were once a stranger in mm -hmm. Egypt. These are the parts of it I find very beautiful. Mm -hmm. The Jewish history that I that really moves me mm -hmm. is like this history of a, of a people who have suffered enormously and have made something of that suffering, mm -hmm. who have turned, who have found a beauty and a moral mm -hmm. courage in that suffering. As Israel has come to represent that less for me, right. it has become more detached from my sense of Jewishness. And my sense, talking to um, other young Jews, like being on college campuses, things yeah, like that, yeah. is that this has happened, whether kind of consciously or, or, yes. or less so, for a lot of people. Yes. And one thing that feels to me to be quite dangerous for Israel long term, yeah. and I, I think you're sort of like beginning to signal this when you, you, you mentioned Bernie Sanders, is that – I am not sure that Israel, if it continues in the direction it goes, um, if you imagine a much more liberal political coalition taking power in America, it can rely on the same intuitive level of connection and support from liberal Jewry that it has had in the past, that it had sort of my grandfather's generation right. or even my father's generation. And I'm uncomfortable with that, mm -hmm. right? Like I don't want uh, – on some level, I don't mm -hmm. want that to be true. Yeah. But on the other hand, I do think that's there. I think that – space is opening up in this conversation that wasn't there before because, you know, I think there are a lot of younger Jews in America who look at Israel and they don't see a Judaism they recognize. They see a place that is overwhelmingly Jewish 
and it has gone in a kind of scary political direction. And like, I don't know, I don't know exactly what you say about that, but you know, you probably just downweight it in the set of things you're worried about in the world. Yeah, I think that's right. And we haven't even mentioned, but this is a big part of it, of course, that you know, one of the things that happened after Pittsburgh was this controversy about the Ashkenazi chief rabbi refusing to call Tree of Life a synagogue, right? Oh, my God. Um, because Israel, the Israeli government, which has a corrupt official Orthodox rabbinate, doesn't recognize the legitimacy of the kind of Judaism that most American Jews practice. And so there was this line where Naftali Bennett says, you know, when the, when the anti-Semites come to kill you, they don't ask if you're Orthodox, conservative, or reform, right? And which I, when my immediate response was, yes, but the Israeli government does, Right. You know, so like that's part of it, even, as, you know, in addition to the Palestinians. And um, you're right. I do think that something really interesting is happening in the Democratic Party. And part of it is that the American Jewish organizational establishment represented, let's above all, by AIPAC, which is the most powerful American Jewish organization, still has an enormous amount of power. But it's not equally distributed between the two parties anymore. Right. Um, it's much, much, much more powerful in the Republican Party. And um, in fact, someone who was running the Obama administration even speculated to me recently that the Democrats in 2020 might not even go and speak at APAC. a lot of them. And in a way, as things have become so partisan, Democrats can afford to ignore – they might still get pilloried by people on the American Jewish right, but those aren't their people. So they don't matter as much to them anymore. They can afford to afford it. And I think what Sanders is going to do, which is going to be really interesting, is his bet is that just as Donald Trump saw that there was a disconnect between Republican elites and Republican voters on trade and immigration, and he could leverage that and then create a model for all the other Republicans. Say, Aha, this is where our people actually are. I think Sanders is going to do that on Israel. He's already saying that he supports conditioning military aid, which is way, way beyond anything Barack Obama ever said. You just wanted to find what that is for people. Yeah, so he's going to basically say, we're not going to give Israel military aid strings with no strings attached. We're going to say maybe you have to reduce settlement growth or something like this. And I think he may find that there is that it is a winning political issue in the Democratic primary, maybe not in the general election. But first of all, think about how many Arab and Muslim and Palestinian Americans have never had anybody actually they could look to on this issue. And as you say, a lot of younger people, there's a still deep anger, I think, among a lot of African Americans about the way Netanyahu treated Barack Obama. All of this is there. And I think it could mean that the Democratic Party moves. It's not going to be like the Labour Party in Britain. The political culture here is, is too different. But um, I do think that people are going to go beyond what Barack Obama did. And the other thing, which I think is part of it, is that the Democratic Party's moved to reliance more on small donors. Because if you rely more on small donors, you also defang. And again, this may, can start to sound like anti-Semitic, but the truth is that one of the ways that the American Jewish organizations wield influence, like every other, like the NRA or whoever, is, is by bundling a lot of donations. If you're not reliant on that, like Beto O'Rourke is, and in some ways you see a real distinction, not only in the population, but even among members of Congress, the Democrats, the younger Democrats tend to be more open to criticizing Israel than the older ones. I also just think, and, and this speaks to some of the things Sanders has been saying, there is just a flat reality that if you have a liberal orientation towards foreign policy right. and your foreign policy is based on some level on a recognition of, of human rights and right. a belief and a rejection of oppression, that where things have gone in Israel is just – it's objectively more offensive. I mean you write about this eloquently and yeah. constantly. Yeah. But, you know, Israel has become a quite brutal police state to the Palestinians. I mean it is – it is not a reasonable way to make people to live. It's like there are many moral atrocities happening all over yes. the world at all times, yes. right? It is not a, a unique one happening there, but it is a real one happening there. And, you know, at some points there's just a much more active peace movement, but there's also kind of been an Israel exception. But the worse it gets, right. just the harder it gets to like carve it out. And then the yeah. more sort of concentrated its support gets in one party, right? I continue to think that Netanyahu made an unbelievable series of, for Israel's future, strategic miscalculations in the way he treated Obama. That it was like I understand the short-term political incentives of it, right. but it was such a bad idea. He right. alienated so many people he needed to have on his side in the long term in the Democratic Party. Like it honestly broke my heart a little bit. But I take those points um, about the political strategy of it and, and how it's lining up, but there is just like – there's just like also a reality of it that, you know, it, it just causes tension. Right. And one of the really interesting things, so one of the most effective things that groups like APAC do is they take members of Congress, but not only members of Congress, all kinds of American influential people to Israel, which is a very powerful experience for a lot of them. And it's understandably, I mean, it's I love going to Israel, but they don't take them to see Palestinian life. 
And in my experience, and most American Jewish leaders also don't actually ever really, they may have been to Israel 77 times, but they've also, also not really ever experienced Palestinian life. So it's kind of like the equivalent of like going to New York City, only spending your time on the Upper East Side, never going to the Bronx, and then basically coming and talking about what you learned about community relations with the police, right? Um, it's not a great analogy, but the point is that they, what they don't see is as important as what they do see. When people actually do go to spend time and, and see life of Palestinians up close, it is generally a transformative. Yeah, which experience. I'm sure you've done many. I've done a bit of a also. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's part of where my attitudes on this come from. Like right. it's, you can't look at that and say it's okay. You just can't. Exactly. All of the rationalizations, it's worse in Syria. They brought yeah. it on themselves. Like they have a certain surface plausibility when we're sitting here in New York. When you actually go and you meet decent, normal people who, are, who have lived there. I mean, let's just think about it in American terms. People in Mississippi in 1953 were at least theoretically citizens of the United States. They couldn't actually actualize that citizenship. They couldn't vote. But they were theoretically citizens. The Palestinians are not, they live under Israeli control. They're not even theoretically citizens of the country under which they live. They never have been, right? So they have the entire state apparatus that dominates their lives is completely unresponsive to them and only responsive to the Jews who live alongside them. So they lose every day in every interaction they have. That is really brutal to see. And I, I think one of the things that I would really hope that people would start to do more is create more of an opportunity for more people to have that experience the, the, that you had. The thing that gets said here where when you bring this up, people are like, well, it's worse in Syria. Right. Like, it is. It yes. is worse in Syria. Like, let me right. just say, like, what right. is happening in Syria right. is, like, it's beyond imagining. But you really can't have it both ways. You can't both have the – there should be a special relationship with Israel and particularly if you're Jewish that you should have a special connection to Israel and feel a stake in its success and its actions and its future and feel like – it represents you and you represent it on some level. And so you should treat it specially. Right. But as soon as you say it's doing wrong, then it has to be in a completely normal, objective, detached, ordinal ranking right. of countries and human rights abuses and whatever all around the world. Like either there is something unique about Israel and the relationship in this case of American Jews to it, which creates something uniquely offensive about Israel acting in this way towards a minority that it is subjugating. Or you can say there is worse things elsewhere in the world, but then like if the idea is that you treat Israel sort of very normally on that on that front, then well, why not on other fronts? Why does Israel get more foreign aid? Why does it get more military aid, right? Like you can't have the special relationship only happen in the positive spaces. Right, exactly, right. I mean, most of these other countries that are doing these horrible things worse than Israel, the United States isn't paying for their militaries, you know, is not paying, giving them right. huge amounts of military aid. We are really deeply implicated in, in those things. And I think a lot of this tends up being kind of whataboutism, you know. And the truth is that things don't have to be the worst, you know, human rights abuse in the world to be bad and to be something that one should be concerned about, especially for Jews. Like, imagine if, you know, Jews were protesting Soviet uh, oppression of Jews in the 1970s, right? I didn't hear a lot of people going and saying, this is double standards because what Pol Pot and Idi Amin are doing is worse, right? This mattered to Jews, right? And I feel like what happens in Israel should matter to Jews, partly because I think it's morally horrendous and partly, as you said, absolutely rightly, from a long-term perspective, it is an existential threat to the survival of the state of Israel. And it's amazing how many former Israeli, you know, military and security heads say that all the time, you know? it's They often sound more left wing than J Street. Yeah. There's always been that strange dimension to it yeah. where the common line 10 years ago was yeah. that the range of opinions yeah. that you're allowed to have in Israel yeah. is broader than the ones yeah. that um, you're allowed to have before getting called bad names in America. Right. Um, it, it does seem to me to have collapsed a little bit within the Israeli political system, mm. but but certainly not all the way. Yeah. Yeah. But I think one of the things, you know, it's not for me to tell anyone else what to write about because there are so many different subjects that really matter and we all have our things to speak but I think that one of the, I would say, the costs of, of extremely successful, extremely talented, not to flatter you, but, you know, people like yourself or, you know, or Matt Iglesias or others of not writing about this. I is, never thought I'd see the day when Peter Beinart was demanding that <laughs> me and Matt know, get back into the Israel conversation. Well, I know. When Marty <laughs> Parrott would be, you know, I never forgive me. For this. Yeah, no, Marty Parrott should not be pleased. <laughs> but I think there are a couple things. First of all, as you know, a great many non-Jews simply are too afraid to write about it, Right. They're just not going to do that because they know that as much of a pain in the neck as it might be for you to be called self-hating Jew, they're going to be called anti-Semitic. So I am always struck, I don't know if you are, by the level of virtual terror often that many non-Jews have about this issue, right? So you have a form of protection that they don't have. Secondly, 
when you show that you can do it and survive, yeah, you, people say some mean things to you, but you survive, you do fine. Well, a lot of this is fear-based. I mean, a lot of this, I think what, what maintains the American political discussion about Israel is the fear that people have. And when people walk through it and come out the other side and survive, that starts to fizzle. To, to under, to but do you think fear is a big part of it anymore? I mean, I remember, I mean, back when I did write about it yeah. more, and I, I again want to say, like, my... I never wrote about it that much. Mm. So me like yes, moving that's to like true. just like mostly not writing about right, it right, right. was not like some huge right, uh, right, like right. change in my right, like I'm having right, this podcast right. on it because like I'm interested. Right, but, right. Um, but it just was like, you know, Donald Trump got elected president. <laughs> like things happened. Right, um, right. But I never found it that scary. Like, mm. I mean, people can call it like I, I occasionally get called a self-hating Jew and mm. like that's never bothered me. I remember right. Marty Pratt's writing um, about me <laughs> that uh, uh, whenever you want to find a Jewish fraud, you'll find them quoting Abraham Joshua Heschel, who I who I love and would quote. Like, they, like I remember that whole thing and I was yeah. a lot – I was younger and less yeah. secure in yeah. my um, yeah. career back then. Yeah. But it always seemed fine. Like, I mean, like Walter Mearsheimer really got uh, – like went through the ringer on that right. book. So like right. I'm not saying there was – you, you right. couldn't find a blowback right. and right. I'm, I take your point that I have some kind of some some armor from actually mm-hmm. being Jewish, but it never felt to me scary. It just it began to feel useless. Yes. Right? In a way that like what was happening there it seemed so different. It seemed like it was moving and collapsing so fast that I just was too far from it to understand it well. Yeah. And like that was part of the feeling of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't like I couldn't do it well. Yeah, but, I think that's true. Although I will just say, I mean, and you're totally right. I mean, you obviously you read about a whole range of issues at a very high level, but I also think that one of the problems of this discourse is that I think the people who do write it a lot about it a lot, people often think they know more than – they assume those people know more than they do well, because they write a lot of right? – Right, right, right. <laughs> it's actually like I think it would – you know, if you needed to get up to speed on something, I think it would take you literally a number of hours to basically get to know as much as a lot of the people who write about this all the time who tend to be more on the political right. But, so, but I, I want to connect it back to sort of the beginning of the conversation because this is a place where I've begun to get – begun to sort of reengage yeah. with it. Which is, on the one hand, I feel very increasingly alienated from Israel as a political entity. On the other hand, you know, like I don't feel able to – not that I would want to deny it. Like I cannot help but see like what is happening in Europe, which is unnerving. And now increasingly what's happening in America. And, you know, if you had taken – you know, go back a couple months, it's like, okay – there are some assholes on the internet. There are always assholes on the right. internet. Like, how do you really weight that? Like, I'm not, I don't look at my Twitter mentions. I don't, you know, like I occasionally get anti-Semitic stuff. Like, mm. I don't, it doesn't bother me mm. that much. I'm pretty inured to that. And I get, <laughs> I get shit on such an array of levels at all times <laughs> that my, my skin is pretty thick. But then it was the, the tree of life yeah. shooting. Yeah. And that feeling of watching Israel go down a path that I think is really politically dangerous and also then politically and ideologically exclusionary, while simultaneously, I at least think you're seeing enough data points to worry that things could get a lot worse in Europe and in the U.S. are not necessarily so bad now, but if things just kept doubling every year for a couple right. of years. Right. Imagine we have a financial crisis. Imagine we have a financial crisis, right? Like you you, you can you yes. can run the story out, yes. right, pretty easily. Yeah. That to me, it's like that's kind of the experience right now that I'm trying to, un- trying to unpack, even just unpack in myself, like the experience of being a, like a liberal Jew in 2018 is an experience that feels qualitatively different than being one in 2015. Yeah, I agree. It does. Um, and it's – it's bewildering, you know, right, for people, uh, you know, you're younger than me, but both of us, I think, grew up in a period where, first of all, where the, we did, we felt like America was different, right? But right. also, this era of world history was different. And it's funny, a lot of the American Jewish organizations said, well, the threat of anti-Semitism now is from the left, right? Because that's the, the BDS movement and the, you know, and so— very few people saw this coming. You know, actually Ben Shapiro, I mean, I'm not, I don't praise him a lot, but Ben Shapiro actually had the honesty to say in a column a couple of years ago that I did, I was wrong. He said, I thought anti-Semitism the, was wrong. You, Peter Beinart, or him, Ben Shapiro? No, that he said he was wrong. He said, uh-huh. I said, he said, I always used to say, and the problem, anti-Semitism now is a feature of the American left, and I was wrong, you know, and he saw it directed at him. I mean, the truth is that we just are in uncharted territory in a lot of ways, in, you know, in America, and we don't really know where things are headed. And I guess my hope would be, first of all, 
Partly, I think the answer is obviously to ally with other vulnerable groups. I also feel like, for me, one of the really moving and like touching things, which I thought was brilliant about what the American Jewish community did in response to Pittsburgh, was this program where they basically said, the next Shabbat, people should go to synagogue. Because, again, and this is my own, maybe my own Mishigas, my own issues, but to me, I also have this fear that people will their Jewishness will be only defined in a negative sense by the sense that they have a sense that people people don't like them, the mm-hmm. anti-Semitism, rather than a sense that actually, you know what, like there's actually some real real beauty and wisdom in this tradition. And like, I could even go to this tradition to help me figure out how to live a good life. You know, I mean, that's what like with my own kids, like I very consciously did not want to talk to them about the Holocaust at all, but not certainly and now they know about it. But like, I wanted just like Judaism to be a source of just, like joy and beauty and wisdom, like, so say, like, here are Jewish texts, here's how, like, you could look at them and they could help answer questions, and, like, yeah, you later on learn that, like, also there's anti-Semitism, but when I grew up, I felt like anti-Semitism was way too central in the definition of Jewishness for me, and it was too negative, and I just don't want this to become now, like, people become more Jewish because they feel like there's more anti-Semitism, like, that's maybe inevitable, but, like, to me, like the most tragic people in the in the Holocaust and in World War II were like the people who didn't actually have much of a Jewish identity, but were then forced to confront it, you know, because of genocidal anti-Semitism. Like, I want people to embrace like the positive parts of it. That's a really interesting point, and I actually resonate to that a lot. I look, I had the very good fortune to come of age in a moment where there was something confusing about the defensiveness of being Jewish. Right. Right. There was something right. confusing about coming of age in America in the time when I did where anti-Semitism seemed as weak as it did, where Jews seemed to be doing as well as they were, where Israel was, while had a lot of problems with Palestinians and and there was real danger, but like was a very well-supported, like strong force on the international stage. And there was this constant narrative of, of Jews as weak when they right. actually looked quite strong yes, to me. Absolutely. And it was genuinely like emotionally confusing, yes. right? And and obviously I, I had grandparents and they grew up in World War II and, and, and they were not themselves in the Holocaust, but you know, I I felt that around me, but there could be this friction between the narrative of Judaism I was given and the experience of Judaism that I had. And I don't want to say I never faced anti-Semitism because I I did. Like I just – I remember that my middle school went through a period where just people loved using the word kike. (laughs) <laughs> like, like I kiked you out of something like, like, Unfortunate. like it was, yeah. So, I mean, I always saw it a little bit around me, but, but it seemed harmlessly transgressive mm-hmm. and like, just like people trying to be jerks as yeah. opposed to like people actually being anti-Semitic. But it wasn't until later when I got really into a lot of Jewish philosophy mm-hmm. um, and sort of met uh, some rabbis who had influenced me that I was able to get a, a kind of deeper appreciation of it for myself. And, and part of that appreciation, I think this is why some of the actions in Israel have been so, uh, so saddening to me, but why they've really just kind of like wrecked my relationship with Israel rather than my relationship with my Judaism was that some of the relationship I developed with Judaism had to do with the relationship between Jews at different times and other dispossessed groups, mm-hmm. right? The, mm-hmm. the the sort of beauty of like the way Jews interacted with the civil rights movement or other things of that nature. And so I, I very much take the point you're drawing out there that you don't want it to all be just this one thing. On the other hand, you know, I – Like, how do you think it changes that if this is a time when there is a need for – I don't want to say a need for more defensiveness, but a a need for attention? Because my my basic theory of what's going on is that there have been a lot of – we have just a functionally stronger political system for many years than we have at this moment. And one of the things that I noticed in that is that there were a lot of – views that were always well represented in the population that the two parties more or less kept a lid on. One of them was sort of anti-immigrant xenophobia. The Republican Party was significantly more pro-immigrant than its base. Um, And then another I think is anti-Semitism where both parties are more um, pro-Israel and pro-Jewish than certainly a good segment of the country is. And one of the things I just see is a weakening of that. Again, I'm not saying that Donald Trump is personally anti-Semitic. I actually don't think he is. But he's, you know, there's definitely, they're definitely not making a huge effort (laughs) to to fight against the parts of their base that are, that don't hold those same views. And and I think that's an interesting thing. The latent weakness there is deeper than I had thought it is. And as the political system weakens, I think the possibility of danger is more serious. Right. I mean, look, this guy in Pittsburgh, he thought that Donald Trump was not anti-Semitic enough. Yes. Right? I mean, like, he did think that. Now, I don't see a whole spate of Republican candidates out there at the congressional or state legislative level who's decided that their political agenda is going to be to move to the more anti-Semitic place, the Donald Trump. Look, I think a lot of it is that Jewish political power and Jewish whiteness 
insulates Jews to some degree from some of this stuff. But I, I also think that, you know, that it's just, it's unpredictable. And the thing that I, that scares me and frustrates me is that I feel like because so much of the American Jewish political influence is focused around defending Israel from any criticism, and because the Israeli government is invested itself in downplaying Trump's complicity with anti-Semitism because they love his Israel policies, that we don't have a Jewish organizational structure that's actually combating anti-Semitism in the right way. Because combating it in the right way would, would require taking a harder line against what Trump is doing on a whole range of things. It would require saying, look, this caravan stuff is going to lead to anti-Semitism. We're going to oppose this kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric because we believe that as a matter of self-defense, we have to. And I think that the most powerful American Jewish organizations can't do that because they are complicit in certain, in various ways with the Trump administration. But I'm sympathetic to the dilemma, I guess I'll say, mm -hmm. because if I were running a big Jewish organization yeah. at this moment and I saw one of the dangers as being that that there was more political polarization around support, certainly for mm -hmm. Israel, mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if not for Jews themselves. The idea that you would pick a fight mm -hmm. at a vulnerable moment mm -hmm. with like one of the really powerful political coalitions when the Israeli leadership has already picked a fight with the other powerful political coalition. Right. That would be a tough that would be a tough space to be. You have Israeli Jewry mm -hmm. going to war with the Democratic right. Party. You have American right. Jewry going to war with the Republican Party. Yeah. Like that's a that's a strategically um complex space. Right. No, it is. Right. And so right, you make a good point. From a certain perspective, you one could argue, as much as I I kind of loathe his value system, that Sheldon Adelson is it's great to have Sheldon Adelson there, right? Because he has a lot of influence with Donald Trump and he concerned about Jews in his own particular way. And so he's going to, you know, that's true. I mean, there is something to that. I just ultimately feel like at the end of the day, I think our best allies are going to be people who share liberal democratic values. We've had a, in the last particular couple of minutes, we've had a lot of talk about political strategy for Jews. But I also just think there's a, a more authentic and deeper question about actual Jewishness. And at this time when there is a, an assault on Jews. I think being in touch with some of the things that make Jewishness strong and make it beautiful and make it enduring is important, sort of separate from the political questions, right? You, you were talking about how you don't want your children to only see Jewishness as defensive. Um, you want them to be in touch with sort of what makes it what makes it remarkable. And you know, that's something that I feel too. And so whether or not it's good political strategy to be creating these sort of alliances with, with other folks. I think that there's something about what makes Jewishness in the long term strong in that it's a kind of morally aspirational and admirable belief system. And I do think the degree to which that is held on to in this period is, is going to be important. I think if that were lost, something much more fundamental would be lost that would be of danger to Jewishness in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one of the things I once heard a rabbi read that I thought was particularly powerful in this regard for me was this kind of question he raised about why, if you look at the arc of the Torah or the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob are already in the land of Israel, right? They're where they need to be at the end, right? So why then the question, do you think is massive detour, right? At least a narrative. The Jews have to, you know, Joseph has to get to slavery and sold into slavery in Egypt. The Jews have to be then oppressed in Egypt. Hundreds of years later, Moses arises. Like, why this massive detour? So this rabbi named David Silber says, well, it's because the tradition did not want, knew that Jews eventually were going to go to the land of Israel, create sovereignty in the land of Israel, eventually create kingships in the land of Israel. And they didn't want Jews to wield that power without having tasted oppression first, right? Because unless you actually have the experience of bondage, you can never rule justly. You have to always have that in the background, right? In the, in the Navi, it says that every king, right, has to write a Torah themselves, right, to write a Sefer Torah. So they're reminded of that experience of bondage. So that, that thing of, of being reminded of that, it seems to me like, so poignant for us today because we always felt like theoretically it was good for us to be reminded of it, you know, so we'd act well. But now it also seems to me like it's also actually very, very critical to our actual safety that we remember that because then we're able to actually form these alliances with these other people who are in, dis in distress. So I think that's a good place to draw this to an end. Um, let me ask you, so I always ask some people to recommend three books here at the end. What are three you'd recommend? And I'm, I'm curious if there are any of particularly you've wanted your children to have this, to be in touch with a, a Jewishness that is non-defensive. Are there, are there books in the space that do get you in touch with that, that you think let you tap into Judaism that 
is about what is beautiful in it rather than what has been um, persecuted within it. Yes. So, you know, one of the things that I, I often subject my kids to, sometimes they're more happy about it than others, is actually um, Jonathan Sachs's commentaries on the weekly Torah portion. So he has a book on each of the first four books of the Torah. He hasn't done Deuteronomy yet. But um, so right now, for instance, if you look at his book, a set of commentaries on the book of Genesis, which he calls the Genesis, the book of beginnings, they're just astonishingly, to me, I have my political problems with John Sachs. He's a little too much of a David Brooksian kind of politically, but like he has an incredible ability to draw meaning out of texts that I think are connected to people's lives. You know, for instance, he writes right now in the Torah, you're reading about the life of Jacob, you know, which is like, and one of the things that's incredible about the life of Jacob that he draws out is something that I have felt much more strongly now that I have kids is that one of the crazy things I find about having kids and then being kind of in this multi-generational thing is you see the way things passed down from generation to generation. Even things that you thought were buried in a previous generation or certain kind of weird personality behaviors or predilections or whatever, you know, they just come back generation after generation, like out of nowhere, you're like, oh my gosh, this thing, yeah, I know where this thing comes from. It's like uncle, you know, so-and-so. And like, that's the life of Jacob. Like, his mother tricks his father to give him the birthright. And then Jacob's entire, what happens at the end of, when Jacob's an adult, his own children trick him, right? When they say that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Like this theme of deception is like, runs throughout the entire course of his life. And Sachs like really unpacks that really beautifully. So that's one thing that I really, really like. I mean, there are other people whose commentaries on the Rabbi Shahel at Hadar is like really, really, also really, really beautiful kind of interpretations of Torah. So I would say that's probably the thing that immediately comes to mind. In terms of other books, I do think, um, I don't know, should I stick on the Jewish theme or just just You can whatever? do whatever you want. The, the, um, now that I mean, you give me the since, sax since recommendation. You mentioned, since you mentioned Heschel, I mean, I think that the uh, Kaplan's biography of Heschel called Spiritual Radical does really do a wonderful job, I think, of capturing him. And like, it has this amazing vignette where, you know, Heschel comes to the United States in the late 30s. He's from a Hasidic dynasty. Like, he has no, and doesn't know anything about America at all. And there's this story that like, he gets, literally comes to New York and he sees a black man shining a white man's shoes. And he's like, oh, that's what happens in America. I get it. Like, I know this story. Like, just this very powerful connection from a guy who didn't know from nothing, like about African-Americans or whatever. So I love that too. Anyway, another, um, I guess a book that I've been thinking about more recently that I read a long time ago is um, Cheslov Milos' book, The Captive Mind, which is a book, I think written in 1951, You'll understand why. It's basically about a series of characters, although he doesn't name them. And it's about how they respond to the emergence of totalitarianism and how their personality characteristics that are latent within them emerge in response to the fact that they're no longer in a free society. Anyway, it's something I think about a lot when I look at certain conservative politicians and intellectuals. And I'm just going to take the opportunity and add one book in from yeah. Heschel, which is um, just The Sabbath, mm-hmm. which is just yeah. one of my favorite books. And I, I talk a lot on, on this show about time and, and, yes, and, yes. and about attention. And there's just there's something very beautiful in that book that even if you are not Jewish, even if you do not hold the Sabbath in any kind of Jewish way, I, just, I, I don't think I've ever known anybody who couldn't get something out of that particular book. It's very, very short but it's very beautiful. Yes, yes. It's a concept that the whole world really needs, you know, especially in the age of iPhones and all that. Peter Beinart, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Peter for being on the show. Thank you to all of you for listening in to my producer, Jillian Weinberger, my engineer, Griffin Tanner. Ezra Klan Show is a Vox Media podcast production and we'll be back next week. How is it possible for one of the most brazen political bribery scandals in American history to play out before the country while nobody's paying attention? Bagman, a new Rachel Maddow podcast from MSNBC, goes back 45 years to dig into a story that got overshadowed in its day. It's got intrigue, corruption, envelopes of cash delivered to the White House. And of course, it's got Rachel Maddow. This is not a well-known tale, but it should be, especially today. That is, again, Bagman, an original podcast from MSNBC's Rachel Maddow. Listen for free wherever you get your podcasts or learn more at msnbc.com slash bagman.